together with Daniel here, and we're going to talk about digging into monodepth, it's all about um, self-supervised monocular depth estimation. Um, we're here from Niantic, which is an international software company, um, and really we're best known for doing um, augmented reality games. The Ingress, Pokemon Go, Harry Potter, um, and underneath all these games there's a world scale augmented reality platform. So it's location based um, and it also relies on you know, very, very technology into mobile phones to make this kind of mixed reality come alive. And here in London we now have an office which is just a hundred meters away from where we are here. Um, and we have a great team of people um, growing uh, growing team, I think we have still have more nationalities than we have people. Um, we're, we're led by um, Gabriel here, who insisted for the purposes of this slide to be defined by his Texan nationality. Um, uh, clear about that. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is learning depth from single images. So you want a system where your input is a color image and your output is for every pixel in that image, you want to know the perpendicular di distance from your camera to where you saw that color. Um, and why do we want this? Um, well, it's useful for various things. Um, we showed last year that you could use this for doing um, occlusions. Without it, um, you it's very hard to get your virtual character to mix correctly with the real world. Um, whereas when you do have depth, you can place, allow this character to be occluded now by your real things. And I'll show some more applications later. Of course, you could do some dense reconstruction for this, but then it's hard with moving objects. Um, and also, it relies on moving cameras. It can be hard to get that baseline for things, particularly with distance. Um, and it's also useful for initializing other processes. So this depth from a single image is good, it's useful. Um, and if you really want good results, you should supervise. Because it turns out we're really good at doing supervised learning. Um, so if you have ground truth depths for every training color image, you can train a neural network to address depths, and it does really well. But when you go outside, it's hard to get that ground truth data. So LiDAR scanners um, are, are quite still expensive, problems with moving objects and um, shiny things. Um, so this kind of motivates then the whole area of learning from something that's a much um, more prevalent sensor, which is an RGB camera. Where there are you know, many more orders of magnitude, uh, more um, color cameras in the world. And the question is then, can we learn depth just using color? And obviously we can, we know about learning, we know about geometry, um, and the first works that did this showed that you could learn about depth from stereo images. So given the left image and a right image, um, we can learn to regress a nice depth map, and we can use our knowledge of geometry to do this. So we have our target frame, and the depth is aligned with the target frame, and we use our depth at training time to warp the pixels of our source frame. So when we warp the pixels, we create this, this, this warped image. It's, we warped our source image. And the idea is that we set up our problem in such a way that when we estimated good depth, this warped frame will look the same as our target frame. So this is where we apply our loss. And you can see here that when the depths are bad, those two images look dissimilar, and the loss is high. Um, and then when eventually we regress good depths, those two images are lying. So that's where our loss is, it's a photometric loss between those two images. Um, but of course, stereo cameras, like the, date, the one captured, used to capture this data, are actually not very common in the world relative to monocular cameras. Most of the, that dream of learning from YouTube, not much stereo data there. Um, but it was shown just, um, uh, CVPR a couple of years ago that you could do this without using stereo pairs. You could learn from sequences of monocular images where now you're learning your depths, but you're also simultaneously learning your poses. 
So you have a posed prediction network which is trained jointly, and the only way that the system can get a low loss, good match between these frames, is to get good depths and good poses. And you train them at the same time. Um, and because both these systems, the stereo train system and the monocular train system, are commonly evaluated on this Kitty data set, we can compare the results. This was the uh, monodep system published by my co-authors um, a couple of years ago, trained with stereo. I and mean, then here, at the same, in the same year, was the system trained with mono. And you can see we've lost a lot of the sharp edges, we've lost a lot of definition around <coughs> the shapes of cars and trees and so on. Um, and it's just not so useful, and you can't do it. So this motivated the work that we did, which was to say, is it possible to get the kind of stereo quality results, but training only from monocular images? Mm -hmm. And of course, because it's a presentation, the answer is yes, you can. Um, and we were very happy that, you know, it was, it was surprising, but we were able to actually get better, right? We were able to get sharper edges and, and nicer shapes around objects. So, so that's what this presentation is about. It's about doing this jump in mono monocular training. Um, and we published this um, last year, this year, I can't remember, in... Um, uh, paper digging into super, self supervised monocular depth estimation with my brilliant co authors here, um, and there's code available as well. So, the main thesis of this paper is that there are some problems with existing monocular methods, and we went through those problems and tried to solve them. So, there's no great holistic thing, it's trying to solve the individual problems. So, here's our learning from mono um, setup with our pose prediction network. And typically we don't just warp one source frame, we warp a small sequence of source frames and the loss is applied per pixel and per frame. So you're trying to make every pixel in every source frame match your target frame. But there's this problem in the real world when you capture videos which is that objects become occluded and disoccluded. So like this tree here, it's, it's hiding part of this car in some of these frames. And so the, the standard approach is you're, you're trying to match, the, say, the front wheel of this car to frames where it doesn't exist, like over here. So you get a good match to one of your source frames, but not to the other. <coughs> And in a traditional baseline system, you're trying to match to all of these pixels, um, and you might think it doesn't really matter because there aren't very many of these pixels that are getting included. But it turns out it does matter. These are getting these things wrong on the boundaries is the important bit. Right? You want to get your, your edges right to get that really nice looking depth map. So our approach was to say, to use our knowledge of geometry, and to say, well, this wheel might not exist in all of our source frames, but it probably exists in at least one of them. So if we compare to all our source frames and find the frame in which we match it the best, we'll just reproject there, we'll just apply a loss there. So instead of matching each pixel to all of the source frames, we just match it to the one which is the closest match. Um, and in practice, this is Depending on how you've written your code, this might just be a one-line change. Right? So you're, you, you have your, all your reprojection losses, back size, your number of frames, your height by width, and instead of averaging over your frames, you take the min over your frames. Turns out this is quite key to getting those sharp edges. We think a good, an example of a good idea is not just when the paper gets cited, but when people actually start using it, and since we published it, people have already been using it, which I think is a good sign that this is something worth doing. So, and it's already existing out in the wild. So that was one seemingly simple problem with monocular depth estimation, which we solved in some, some way. Another problem is scenes that violate this static scene moving camera assumption. And when you've got moving objects, things can go wrong, and one particularly harmful type of moving objects are these things that move at ego velocity. So objects that move at approximately the same velocity as the camera. 
may appear to be roughly static in image space. And learning from sequences like this can cause test time artifacts like this, where this car, type of car that was observed to be moving at training time, is now projected out to infinity. So you get these kind of black holes in the image. And um, our proposed solution to this is to remove these pixels at training time. And people have proposed masks before, but here we just use a very simple um, observation, which is that these ego-moving pixels tend to be roughly static in the image. So when you come to your loss formulation, you say, if they're roughly similar between your target frame and your source frame, you should probably ignore it. And you compare it to your warped source frame, and you say, well, particularly early on in training, if you're more similar to your unwarped source frame than you are to your warped source frame, leave it out of a loss. You can see it in practice here. These cars here are, are blacked out. They're masked from the training. And it also applies when the camera's static. So here the cars stopped at red light, and it's almost all of the pixels that we now ignore from the training. It turns out when you apply this now, these black hole objects, these, these objects that disappear, are more likely to be recovered at test time. So I don't have much time, we're coming up to lunch, so I will gloss over full resolution multi scale. But if you are doing self supervised training, doing reprojection, you should probably consider this. The, the aim is that you're getting some of the benefits of doing things at high resolution, but without making it any slower at test time just doing as much stuff during training time as possible at a higher image scale. I'll come on to experiments now, um, before I then hand over to Danya. Um, so in our experiments we use the storm baseline, so we do sensible things, we use a good depth encoder, we use a good pose encoder, that's really important. We do good augmentations, we use image net pre-training, we do sensible border padding, and this is a good baseline system. And then our contributions are evaluated on top of that. And we evaluate on the um, Kitty test set. Here's our baseline compared to the work from a couple of years ago on the absolute relative error. And then each of our contributions in turn helps, makes things better. And when you add all of them together, you get the best overall system. And this story is then repeated across the other metrics. Kitty. But of course we didn't just compare to this work from uh, a couple of years ago, we also compared to all the other recent works in uh, monocular depth estimation and generally on the self-supervised measures, they're pretty ahead on numbers. When you compare, I haven't shown here the supervised methods, there's still a little way to go there. <coughs> so here's an example. Ah, you don't finish this. That's all right. Um, there's a, um, there's a really nice video, which you'll see later, um, which is to do with um, just showing, you know, kitty results, don't care about that. You see some limitations here, um, where it can go wrong when you've got, um, you know, you rely on reprojection. So if stuff's blank, trying to learn this system in this room probably wouldn't work, because you've got these blank walls, you don't have any nice textures to reproject. And also you can struggle around sort of intricate shapes, like around here, around sort of um, railings and signposts can be difficult. Okay, we showed at the beginning how you can use this for occlusions. Here's a nice other example mm -hmm. where you can use it for doing a sort of depth of field effect um, on a single image, which is just a nice sort of example of how you can click and edit a photo using your depth estimation. And what I've talked about today, I think the first thing is in these, when you're doing these dense reprojection methods, not all pixels help. Sometimes rather than including more pixels, you can actually do better by ignoring some pixels. Full resolution multiscale is useful. There's some tips for doing strong baselines, but importantly, there are still more challenges to solve. This is definitely not a solved problem. We were pleased to get some results on some YouTube data, so going out and training this on videos like this. But you can see here there's, there's, a, there's a scene shape, but there's still problems. 
Um, and I think making this kind of result better is one of the big open areas for the future. Now I'm going to hand over to Daniel, who's going to talk about really exciting uh, things for stereo depth estimation. Uh, yeah, so I'm Daniel, and uh, I'm going to talk about stereo. So Michael covered the improvements in using the data that is available, but in the setup where you actually have, uh, so uh, in, in the setup where you actually have stereo information, I think there's still a lot of improvement that can happen, and I think we're exporting that information uh, like to the limit. And so this is a joint work with uh, these people, and Jamie Watson is the lead on this project. And so in the stereo setup, you have your intrinsics, you have your camera poses between the two views, and you use two stereo images to train. And so uh, the only thing that you need to predict is depth, everything else is given. And so the way you train it is you compare the target and the reprojected, uh, reconstructed image by uh, warping the soft frame into the target view. And so what is really important actually is the way you compute this force. So how do you compare the images? And the thing that works really well is uh, this kind of linear combination of the SSA and dissimilarity and L1 difference. And this, is, this has become a standard choice. Everyone use it, uses it. There are some works that do kind of uh, BGG features or some other kind of uh, uh, deep learned things, but I would say that 90% of the papers that do any kind of quality depth estimation actually use this kind of force. And this is what we're trying to kind of look into. What is actually the, the kind of, uh, you know, the importance of this. And so if you use this loss, you can have the stereo pair at training time and you use a left image and you predict the depth map. And you can see that the depth map is like, it's okay, but it's not great. Probably could be better. And so the thing that is really kind of uh, bad about this is thin structures. And if you zoom in on this tree support uh, and look at the patches, you can see that, you know, the thing is actually missing here. So, what is the problem here? Like, why is this happening? Like, one of the first hypotheses that we had is maybe the reprojection loss that we're using actually is forcing this kind of artifact. Maybe this is actually the best reprojection loss that we can achieve, and it's just bad reprojection loss that we're using. So, uh, we kind of looked into that, and we tried to choose this one pixel. Uh, on the left, uh, on the from the left image, and then try to evaluate densely what is the reprojection loss value for all the possible disparities. So on the x-axis, axis here is the different uh, possible disparities for the small point in the middle of that patch, and you warp the patches from the source frame, and then you compute the reprojection loss and you plot it. And so the thing that is like red group over there is the uh, level of prediction at every epoch. And you can see, as you training, the prediction is basically bouncing around that disparity of 18. And so it's stuck in that local basin. And if you look at the wider information that is available for the data set, and you actually look at where is it on this reprojection loss, it's actually here. And so it means that the problem is not really the reprojection loss. It means that the problem is the optimization of the network. It's not getting to the correct uh, local minimum. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, at training time, we actually have the access to both of the views of the stereo. And so maybe, maybe we can densely compute all of the depth, uh, kind of depth values and reprojection losses for all the pixels and then choose the best local minimum. But that's kind of expensive. And uh, kind of there's an easy way to get something reasonable already. And that's to use a uh, fast and off the shelf algorithm that is available. Uh, one of those is OpenCV's SG, SGM implementation, so semi global matching. And uh, you get this kind of depth map if you use these two images. And you can see that the artifacts that are present in these depth images are quite different. So for the network prediction, you miss the thin structures, but you also get like blurry edges around the objects, and you also get uh, kind of fatter boundaries of the objects that you actually can. can detect and predict the depth for. And SGM has a different set of uh, problems. So it, if it cannot do uh, matching, then it produces this unknown depth kind of estimate. So there are fusion shadows for things that are included or kind of ambiguous. 
There are also these weird spurious matches in the sky where you have too many matching things and because of the noise in the images or some other behavior, it tries to predict something that is incorrect. And in this image, it, it has found that uh, problem in the sky, but sometimes, and quite often actually, it happens on the road. So there are a few pixels on the bottom that look like that. Uh, there's noise because of this uh, ambiguous matching problem, and uh, there are sometimes holes in the DEF RAM where you shouldn't really have those. However, there, the two DEF RAMs actually have also different types of strengths. So the network prediction doesn't have any holes, and the SGM has managed to find some DEF value for these thin objects. So uh, let's see how good the SGM uh, Depth predictions are for these thin objects. So, if we go back to the same pixel on the same patch on the preset board and look at the um, reprojection loss landscape, then we see that the SGM depth is actually over here, right on top of wider. So, for this pixel, it has found something that is actually useful, and the idea is can we somehow exploit that information now? Now, the problem is that the, you know, uh, the SGM is noisy but it produces a, a depth map as an output. So how can we incorporate that into our training? Uh, well, since the SGM output is a depth map, mm -hmm. then it means that we're back to supervised learning, and now you need to choose what kind of force function do you use to minimize the, the uh, difference between the general predictions and the ground truth, uh, in this case, pseudo ground truth. And there are like lots of different uh, choices in the literature. So uh, Gargatel, in their very first paper that did depth prediction, they used L2 as one of the baselines for their method, and they actually trained with the OpenCV, uh, OpenCV uh, SGM outputs to, to, to kind of compare it against their, their own uh, setup. And we all know that when you train with L2, because of this unimodal assumption about the data distribution, you kind of get blurry results where instead of having two modes in your predictions, you kind of average in between. So the depth maps are quite blurry, and that's what Gargit Al also observed in their paper. If you have access to some really, really high quality depth values, like coming from LiDAR or from very like, elaborate uh, SLAM systems, then you can probably use uh, reverse Hoover, so Bebu was, and uh, you know, the papers uh, like from Ynet, Donatis, and so forth, all they, they use those kind of uh, losses. And also, if you have depth, you can apply these losses, but you also can apply the same losses on disparities, so the inverse depth. So um, in this case, we use the logo one, which has been used for Kinect depth, and I think the noise in the SGM and Kinect kind of are more similar than any of the other examples that have been uh, seen so far. And so how can we still incorporate the depth information from coming from SGM, but make it graceful so that the noise and uh, spurious matches don't distract us from the actual uh, graph of depth. So the key idea that we uh, thought about is to follow this depth hint that is coming from SGM, and so ignore bad hints. And this is the uh, kind of the loss function <coughs> that we propose. And so we, when we train, we have a prediction for a given image that is the I that is coming from the network. And we have an estimate of the depth that is coming from SGM, which is a hint HI. And then we compute the reprojection loss for both of those uh, depth values. And if the depth coming from the SGM is bad, the reprojection is not better than the reprojection coming from the network, then just ignore it and use the reprojection loss to train. But if it's actually better, it's giving a better local minimum on the, in terms of the reprojection loss, then we add that supervisory data into our loss function. And these are the two choices for the supervision signal and for the reprojection error uh, in our case. So this is still self-supervised training because we only use stereo. There is no additional sensory information. Uh, and these are the results that we can get when we train with this. So the, uh, on the left is just using reprojection and on the right bottom is using the depth hints. And you can see that it managed to ignore the spurious matches and all the noise in the, in, the, in the ground during training and it has recovered some of the thin structures. So we, again, if you look back at the pixel that we were interested in, we can see in here with the blue is uh, the predictions of the network that were trained with the depth hints loss. As the network is uh, training at every epoch, we look at what the predictions are for this uh, image and it's converging into the correct uh, local minimum. 
So you might be thinking that, well, th this sounds nice, but I'm sure there's this kind of way of incorporating that that might be even better. And so we tried to compare uh, all the possible alternatives that we could think about so, uh, and, and see what kind of numerical uh, values we're getting. So the first one is just using reprojection error, and that's one of them. And then if we ignore the reprojection error and just train with the uh, depth that is coming from uh, SGM, we get this kind of uh, proxy supervised uh, setup where it's only uh, pseudo supervised data. And we're getting some scores are better, some scores are worse. But uh, the thing is, uh, with SGM, you need to know which kind of hyperparameters work best for the, any particular serial pair, and you don't know them in advance. So what we, we try to do is we try to, at training time, try all the different hyperparameters for any uh, particular uh, serial pair and just choose randomly a hyperparameter that you know, is coming from a range of possible good hyperparameters and give that as a target to the, uh, to the neural network. So at, at every epoch, any particular image in the training set is getting a different, possibly a different depth map as a target, which might be confusing the uh, network. So we thought maybe we could combine all of these possible, like all of these different depth maps into a single consistent depth map that is constant throughout the training for any particular image. And uh, the way we try that is by looking at the reprojection error for all of those uh, different depth maps, and so choose the depth map that is actually the best according to the reprojection error that we're using. So uh, DSSM plus L1 was. And it's interesting that for this uh, setup, the DSSM, uh, DSSM L1 is actually indirectly given to the network as a surprise reason. We got some improvement, you can see that. Uh, there is another baseline which is uh, just add the two, which is a standard way of uh, incorporating any kind of additional information in training, usually, and you get even better results. Um, but you can think about this addition as a way of uh, regularizing your training. So the supervisory signal that is uh, logger one here is actually basically encouraging the network to come up with predictions that are consistent with SGM. But since SGM is noisy, maybe that's not the best uh, plan. Um, another version is to first pre-train on SGM and then fine-tune on the projection error. Uh, it doesn't work as well. Uh, we also tried the uh, loss coming from the uh, Maria Code and the Drevedaldi paper where they uh, have uncertainty over the depth maps and that makes a lot of sense for molecular training in their case uh, because of moving objects and uh, ambiguities but uh, in our setup it didn't really perform uh, that much better and this is the depth hint. so you know we get the best scores and um, the scores are improved especially in the square relative and RMSC uh, scores, which use the squared error. So now the different, the bad predictions of depth or thin structures are penalized more rather than the absolute relative or the RMSC log because just the number of thin structures, uh, the thin objects, the number of pixels of those in the test set is not that high. Uh, here is the benchmark on the Kitty uh, eigenspit. So in the stereo case, we decided to split it into two categories depending on the resolution because higher resolution you have for your training, uh, the better scores you tend to get. And there are also like many different other uh, small differences that matter a lot, like uh, whether you are cross-processing the depth maps, whether you are using pre-trained network for uh, training, or uh, maybe the number of parameters in the network. And if we try to kind of do apples to apples comparison, we the laws that we're proposing actually gives the best uh, results. Uh, so, especially in the high resolution, the main thing, uh, the main contender there is uh, super depth, and we are getting massive improvements on that one. And so, here is the video of uh, the depth map that we train uh, that we learn. And so, digging in, in here is kind of refers to the previous incarnation of model two. So the model that we actually did the results now, but just for the sake of this video, we try to compare with the best data we had at the time. And so, um, as you can see, we didn't inherit like, any of the bad, uh, kind of noisy, uh, spurious matches from SGM. We still managed to get good depth for the ground. There are no holes. 
and thin structures are actually much more prevalent in our case, I would say. Okay, so some of the takeaways before lunch. Uh, stereo matching, if you do it uh, densely with a cross volume, you get pretty good depth sometimes. Uh, there are different ways of augmenting the reproduction loss with additional supervisory data. And if your depth estimates are noisy, don't trust them blindly, try to do something smart about it. And uh, thank you for the attention. And for, the, for anyone who's interested in this kind of work, please consider applying. We are happy. So thank you. Thanks, very interesting stuff. Um, I think in your alternative losses, there's one thing that was missing, which is no loss at all for, for your depth supervision, but use it as an initialization.